going to record. Yep. Okay. So. <coughs> okay. Right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, I've just had a lovely experience of being able to see everybody. Um, and it's made me feel a lot more relaxed, which is absolutely gorgeous. Um, I'm, as most of you know, I'm Sandra Taylor. I'm an EFT trainer and I'm the coordinator of um, the British EFT Centre. And I'm a member of the DMT, its decision-making team. Um, there's currently um, 52 participants. So that is totally amazing. And we're together for the first of three sessions of my theory group. Um, I really appreciate you all coming and I hope that you find it really worthwhile. Um, okay. Um, so as you know, um, the British EFT Centre's decision-making team wanted to offer some free learning opportunities to people during this, this absolutely awful time of COVID-19. Um, to, and it's to BEFT members, the live sessions are to BEFT members and to those whose EFT training with myself and Helena has been disrupted because of the virus. Um, so what we decided to do, there's three of us in the group. So what we decided to do, Sarah and Helena and I, was to offer three sessions of three different groups with three different leaders. So I'm running um, the theory group and Helena Iguabike, EFT trainer. She's running a practice group that starts next week. And Sarah McConnell, EFT supervisor, is running a reading group that starts the week after that. And you've all been sent the details and we'll remind you. And I also want to say a special thank you to Joy Wanless and Janine Murray, who last week ran a session on working online with 12 of the BEFT members. That's absolutely fabulous. Yeah. Um, so as you know, we're recording the sessions and they will be uploaded to a BEFT YouTube channel that we've set up. And then those recordings will be open to anyone. So we're not allowing you to record um, at this point um, because, you know, a kind of reminder to you again is you, you all know it, but it's so easy to not do it. Um, when you do get involved at different points in this session and in the other sessions, you need not to um, say anything that is um, that is personal that might um, that sorry that might identify people. Sorry, I'm distracted by people being on the video and being able to hear things. Can everybody go on mute and no video? Um, that would be really helpful. Okay, so Mary Beth, you're on video. I can't, I can't see your name for me to be able to get you off video. Can you do that? Okay, that's fabulous. Not on video anymore. Fabulous. Okay, can right? Everybody should be mute now. As well. Is that okay? Fabulous. Okay, so basically I'm not letting other people record in case anybody does inadvertently say anything that, that identifies anybody because we'd have to take that out um, of any recording that we would then put on YouTube. But you'll have access to the YouTube video afterwards. Um, okay, so I'll be doing most of the talking today, but I'm aiming to involve you at times as well. And we'll do that through the chat function. Okay, so um, if you're on a on a... Um, computer then you will see the chat at the bottom um, as an option and when you click on it you should see um, a whole thing on the right hand side and you can write in it at the bottom right and you can also watch what other people are writing as well um, when I share my screen and I've got my presentation up uh, you might have a kind of strip of people um, on the right hand side and you can hover over it and press a minus and then that should all just go away so that 
you can just get a clear view of what I'm sharing with you. Um, so let's practice the chat facility now. How about um, some of you type in a brief hello from yourself to the group? Okay, Claire. Hi, everyone. Isabel, Mike, Aniko, Nick, hi all, Mary Beth, Philomena, Nadine. Oh, yes, look at this. Good morning, all. Hi, Janine, Andrea, Kate, Sandy, Nicolette, Limey. Connell, yeah, Maggie, I can't follow it so much, it's so quick. Bonjour, hi Miriam. Mm -hmm. a... Okay, thank you. So it looks like a lot of you have really got the hang of this. That is really, really nice, thank you. Okay, so thank you. So the bit at the beginning where I, I met a lot of people who were coming in early was just fabulous. And now with, with all those hellos as well, it, it feels like, although I'm kind of just talking to a camera, I'm talking to all of you, which is really lovely. So this is the theory group and um, I'm talking theory, talking about the literature. Um, as Sue Johnson has said, um, among other people, um, there is nothing as practical as a good theory. And that's what I find. That's the thing that I love about theory, not just for its own sake, but how does it help me think about my practice differently? How does it help me improve what I'm actually doing? Um, and I know that for lots of people, theory is actually a turn off. Yeah, sometimes I do feel a bit like a weird person who actually really loves theory. But I hope that, that through my session, um, that maybe, you know, you might just, if you haven't been so into theory before, just a little bit more than you were before, perhaps. So I asked people what they wanted to cover today. And Murian from France, she was the first. She asked me to explain the AIRM, the Attachment Injury Resolution Model. And I started to review the literature while I was also asking her about what specifically um, was the thing that was puzzling her. And I got just so fascinated. Yeah, I just looked across the literature. I looked at how things had developed, um, what was in one place, what was in, and not in others, where things were the same, where things were different. And hopefully I've brought together a really rich, cohesive picture that I'm going to share with you today. Um, now, it's really ironic because as I explored really broadly about attachment injuries and the AIRM, Murian came back with her more specific question. Um, can we have everybody on mute? I'm pressing mute, but it's not all mute. Okay, so if everybody could make sure they're mute, that's brilliant. So yeah, ironically, I'm going really wide with exploring attachment injuries and attachment injury resolution model. And Muriel comes back and she says, the, the question I have is, um, it's about creating a new narrative of the event. That's the bit that's not clear to me. And ironically, in all my exploring, that is actually rarely mentioned and never expanded on. So um, the literature doesn't always cover what you want as much as you want. So I'm hoping that together, after I've talked, you'll be able to help me answer that question. Um, so my aim is to cover attachment injuries and the AIRM and then have 30 minutes to cover a couple of other questions that were given to me around assessment and diagnosis before we finish the first session. So let's begin. So Judy, you said, please mute me. I've got mute all. Um, maybe if I press that. Right. Okay. So if everybody comes it mutes themselves and comes off video, okay, I've, I've pressed mute all. Um, yeah, I've got a, I've got a um, mute all thing and I've got, I can get rid of people's videos as well, but mute all doesn't seem to be muting everybody. Okay. So, so I'm going to share screen and we're going to do this presentation. So as I said, if you've got people on the right hand side, you hover over it and there's a minus in its various forms, depending on what you're on. 
um, and you can take that away or even just move it so I can move mine up to the top right out of the way so that you can see the slides okay I can't see the chat bar or anything else now I can just see the slides so I'm hoping everybody's okay because I'm not going to be able to um, do anything about it otherwise okay so what we have is the attachment injury and the attachment injury resolution model Okay, need to, ah, there we go. Okay, so one of the things that really interested me, I actually didn't know, and I don't think I would be unusual in it, that this term that I'm so used to, attachment injury, is actually one that is deemed to have been coined by Sue Johnson. Yeah, that this is another of the really useful things that she has offered the therapy world. So in 1988, Greenberg and Johnson were noticing that when the work was being done with couples, that there was an impasse with some couples. And at that point, they were just really noticing it. In 1996, Sue was talking about attachment betrayals or crimes. And in a personal communication to John Milliken, in 1998, she's actually using the term attachment injuries. The identification of attachment injuries was based on clinical experience. That's the first time that, as far as I know, we have in print the word, the phrase attachment injuries. Yeah, and in 1999, she, John, Sue writes an article with Whiffin and attachment injuries just start to be a little bit more defined in that. One thing that really kind of takes things forward is that John Milliken writes a, his doctoral dissertation in 2000 on resolving attachment injuries in couples using emotionally focused therapy. Yeah, what he says when he's doing his, his thesis is there is no reference to attachment injuries other than Johnson's. So again, that, that kind of strengthens um, the, the proof, if you like, that Sue was the one to, to coin this term. So he's using that term comfortably and he's also using attachment injury resolution model, interestingly enough. Yeah. So John Milliken, as Sue was part of his dissertation um, group, um, was part of his research. So she was very involved with, with, with all of this, which would be no surprise. really. And then in 2001, we have an article, which is, if you like, the article, which is seen to be the one where the term attachment injury is really identified and operationalized. Yeah. So Although it has been kind of used before, it's that article which is seen to be the one where attachment injuries um, are really coined and used. Um, and Barant and Obegi, who are not EFTers, um, but refer to this phrase, yeah, they say that is where this newly defined construct of attachment is identified, yeah. So it's a really important part of seeing the history that actually we haven't had this phrase except from about 1999. Um, so let's go for a definition and we're gonna use that 2001 article to give us one because it, it's the place where you go back to the source. This is the main place that we're gonna look for the definition. So let's break it down. It occurs when one partner violates the expectation that the other will offer comfort and caring in times of danger or distress. Okay, so we are hoping to have a safe attachment relationship with our partner, to have a partner who we can turn to when we're distressed and actually the partner is not there. Yeah, this incident becomes a clinically recurring theme and it creates an impasse that blocks relationship repair. 
yeah, relationship repair. So basically, it comes back, it comes back, it comes back. It does not seem to resolve, and people get stuck in couples therapy. Yeah, so even in EFT, people get stuck with this. It's characterized by an abandonment or betrayal of trust during a critical moment of need. Yeah, so often the person is in need, is in a vulnerable place, and the partner is not there. Then what happens is it defines the relationship as insecure and relationship distress continues to be there underlying all the time. Even when the couple feel as if they put it to one side, the essential distress and insecurity of the relationship is still there because at some level that becomes the standard for whether the person's dependable or not, i.e., when I am in real need and I ask you for help, you know, you may not be there for me. I cannot trust that you will be there. Okay. So an attachment injury can be seen as a trauma with a small T. Yeah. It calls into question these basic assumptions about the relationship and people will often talk about it in life and death terms. Yeah. They will often talk about something shattering. Yeah. I will never trust you again. And people can have post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, so they can really ruminate on it. They can become really hypervigilant and they can also numb out and they can move between those three. Yeah. Um, a couple of quotes uh, that are often used um, from Judith Herman's work on trauma is that attachment injuries can leave an indelible imprint. And then the other one that's often used is that attachment injuries can be a violation of human connection. Yeah. Um, so what's really important is for you to be able to work out, is it an attachment injury? So if we're looking at the literature, what the points that they're making are, is it, and a couple of, three of these, I think, come particularly from Laurie Brubacker's book, Stepping Into Emotionally Focused Couple Therapy. Um, so is it a specific incident rather than a slow erosion? Yeah, so it's, it's not a continual, the person's disappointing you, they kind of keep not being there under this kind of circumstance. Um, an attachment injury is a specific incident, okay? Um, does it occur in this partner relationship? Yeah, we can get drawn to attachment injuries that have maybe happened in the person's life with previous partners or in their childhood or with other people. That's not what we're talking about, yeah? What we're talking about as an attachment injury is it's in this relationship. Um, is it at a time of vulnerability or need? Yeah. So usually it will happen when the person is feeling vulnerable. So it might be, for example, somebody who is pregnant and um, needing to go to the hospital and the partner is not there. Yeah. They might not even be able to be there. They might be on a plane coming back um, and it's delayed. Yeah, but the injury can still occur or it might be something very active, like learning later that while I was giving birth and you weren't there, you were actually with your um, with your affair partner having sex. Yeah. There are times when that that's maybe a little bit um, less clear so for example somebody who who feels as if they've been very trusting in the relationship very clear um, about you know its trustworthiness and its healthiness um, suddenly finds something say in in you know a receipt in a coat or something um, where there is proof of an affair that they didn't expect and that that shatters something in that moment but predominantly what we're talking about is the relationship being in a state of vulnerability or need. 
And then a, the next piece is, mm -hmm. you know, is the attachment significance. It's got to have a huge attachment significance. Um, it's got to have that never again quality. Yeah. And even in 2000, Millikan was saying, you know, not every critical relationship event is an attachment injury. You can have two couples going through roughly the same experience with the same interactions and one will have hardly any problems and in the other there might be really significant relationship damage. Um, it's the attachment significance that is key, not the content. Yeah, so it as Narman and others in 2005 said in their article, whether something is judged as an attachment injury depends solely on the perceptions of the injured partner rather than on some external criteria. Yeah. So we need to take care when we are considering something to be an attachment injury. Yeah. Because what we can do is we can get a bit kind of broad in our explaining things um, or in our assumptions. You know, as soon as we heard the word affair, we may think, oh, attachment injury. Yeah. But one th that an affair does not necessarily cause an attachment injury. And even if it does, what is it about the attack about the affair that caused the attachment injury? Yeah. So it might be the break in trust or it might be. Um, that you told me, you, you know, you lied. You know, when I asked you about it, you lied. But there's often something that is very specific that is the core of the pain, yeah? And this is really important because when you are looking at the literature, you can see that, that errors are made. So, for example, Shade and Sandberg write in 2012 in their article about infidelity, that infidelity can be considered as an attachment injury. Yeah, but what you know now is actually in and of itself, no, it isn't. Um, and then there's another article on trans-identified people and attachment injuries by Chapman and Caldwell also in 2012. And they say that when a partner comes out as trans-identified, their presence in the relationship is such that they're no longer accessible or available to the remaining partner in the form to which the remaining partner has been bonded. On this basis, the authors believe that an attachment injury is created. Yeah. So what we know is that, yes, that kind of situation may well in some way cause an attachment injury, but in and of itself, it is not one. Okay, so it's important to have that awareness that when you're looking at literature it doesn't mean that every time people have got it right yeah um, so we often do think about attachment injuries when people are talking about affairs but we need to be really clear as i've said about if it is what it is It's the attachment injury significance. It's the attachment significance assigned to the injury and the continued inability to heal it that counts. That actually each time they fail to resolve it, the injury usually deepens. Yeah, so it's not the content, it's the process. But it is really common that attachment injuries will be connected in, in some way to an affair. Um, and Mackinnon and Edgar in their article around attachment injuries talk about how in Western culture, um, often we have agreements that relationships are monogamous. Um, and it's not just the breach in the moral agreement of sexual exclusivity that's destructive. It's the loss of trust, it's the deceit, it's the betrayal of shared values. It kind of can really shake what what is our relationship based on? And when we're looking at open relationships and we're looking at polyamory where, where the sexual relationships are more than between two people, we can still have attachment injuries. So for example, 
um, it might be that there is an agreement that you know you it can each go and have sex with somebody else but you're not to get emotionally involved and then somebody does yeah or we can share together maybe having sex with somebody else but we don't have sex by ourselves with somebody else yeah so it's it's breaking the agreement that is within the two or more people that is the really crucial thing yeah. so one thing i found really interesting i don't know if, if it will interest you or not but um was the literature does tend to see the pursuer as the injured partner yes so i think it is relevant that as you as you read you kind of have an understanding of, of what that's about so it's partly about when attachment injuries were originally noticed by greenberg and johnson yeah it was at the time where the couple had done the withdrawal re-engagement and they were moving towards pursuer softening and it didn't get there yeah there was a lot of resistance um, and maybe an attachment injury event became apparent, which obviously they didn't have the formulation to know what that was exactly at that point because it hadn't been developed. Yeah. So basically in the, in the beginning, when these things were starting to be noticed, it was being noticed in the pursuer. Um, also, one of the things that's noticed noted in the literature is that you know what you're working with in an attachment injury is the current cycle and the current cycle um, related to the attachment injury may not be the usual cycle so it means that you know the withdrawer pursuer position may have shifted because of the attachment injury and therefore somebody who usually is a withdrawer is now a pursuer within this attachment injury in their kind of you know mm -hmm. fight back against it um, but some literature does note that the withdrawer can be the injured party. Millikan noted it in 2000 and, and Laurie Brubacher notes it in her book in 2018. You know, it isn't always the pursuer. Um, and also when we're looking at a really crucial article in 2013, which was looking at attachment injury resolution, they described the AIRM as an injury specific blame a softening process yeah so that's a really important piece is that what they're seeing is that the person who has been injured will often move into a blamer position and that there needs to be an injury specific softening process to deal with that So what, why do we need this kind of term attachment injuries? Why do we need the AIRM? Yeah, haven't we got a perfectly good and amazing uh, model in EFT anyway? We've got an amazing model, but attachment injuries are the bits that really get stuck. Yeah, and we need to be able to identify it to be able to actually work on it and work it through. Otherwise, what we have seen again and again is it just stays and it keeps on going. It keeps on destroying the relationship. Yeah, it blocks relationship repair. So even if couples kind of feel as if they've done a bit of work, they've put a plaster over it, they've sewn it up a little bit, um, it won't be enough. It needs to be dealt with very specifically. And one of the things that is really, really important and, and sort of the thing that is so difficult about an attachment injury is that the person who has done the injury is the source of the pain, but also the solution to the pain. So if we look at that image there, you know, we can be injecting medicine, but we can also be injecting poison. Yeah, and it can feel as if it runs between the two of them. It's very disorganizing to the attachment system, to the person's sense of what this relationship is and who they are. Yeah, so it's not surprising that the injured party will swing around 
between hypo aroused and hyper aroused yeah accusing and clinging numbing and withdrawing yeah it becomes really chaotic and actually often you know you probably experience this yourselves with a cup with couples it becomes quite aversive to both partners they both get really fed up of it it feels like it's going nowhere that all it's doing is being destructive and yet they can't get themselves out of it yeah and you know even when the injured person kind of pulls comfort from the other one how do they trust it yeah so this is a really core piece around attachment injuries is the fact that the the, the person who's done something actively or or or, or just not been able to 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 um, be there for example um is the source of and solution to pain yeah one of the things that people often wonder is when will it become apparent? You know, when does it show up? Yeah. And, and Laurie Brubeck is really helpful with this one in her stepping into um, emotionally focused couples therapy. Yeah. So she says that, that there's kind of three ways that it shows up. It shows up in real emotional intensity and it often comes in as a gaping wound that's very visible at the start of therapy. Yeah. It might also be something that is hinted at. It doesn't block stage one, um, but in stage two, it comes back. They can do the, um, they can do the calming down. Yeah. They can do the moving towards stage two, but when you're trying to do the deeper healing work, the restructuring work of stage two, it, it's just back there. And then it can also just roar out in stage two, you know, when you're working on the withdrawal re-engagement or working with the pursuer softening. Yeah. So it might come out, for example, you know, when the, the withdrawer is doing some re-engagement and asking for something and the pursuer comes in and says, why the heck should I give you that when? Da, 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 da. Yeah. It's really helpful to know that it does not always come out clearly at the beginning. And one of the reasons it doesn't always come out is, is around safety. But another one is around um, sometimes the couple don't know. They, they don't realize that something that happened is having such a deep effect on them until they're starting to kind of reach back to each other. So the challenge for us, the really pivotal challenge, is can we create a kind of alliance in which the therapist can attune to both partners with that real sensitivity that's needed in this delicate area? Yeah, we need a secure base to be able to support this couple to change. Okay. So one of the things that people have asked again and again over time is how do I work with attachment injuries in stage one? Um, there isn't a lot of literature. And again, it's Laurie Brubacker who gives us the literature on this, which is incredibly helpful. Yeah. Um, what we know is we can't ignore it or resolve it in the negativity that is there in stage one. We actually are going to have to de-escalate it to be able to get to repair it uh, so the job in, st in the attack in in stage one is to do de-escalation with the current cycle yeah so if we have a really active attachment injury that they're bringing from the beginning yeah we'll be using the current cycle which has the attachment injury in it yeah so what she talks about is tracking a cycle yeah so it's not getting into all the content and things. It's tracking this cycle. So the first thing is to boldly name the injury. Yeah. And how it is part of this current cycle that keeps the hurt alive. Now, boldly naming, besides sounding like Star Trek, um, is also a really big challenge. Um, Sarah and I did a, um, a SITSID group, which was a local EFT group um, with um, EFTers a year or two ago. And we, we looked at working with attachment injuries in stage one. And, and we did an exercise on, on just doing this. 
boldly name it, look at how it works in the current cycle. And, and as Laurie talks about, therapists find it incredibly difficult to actually name the injury. It's like that trepidation of, am I going to shame him? Am I going to feed the, 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 the other partner? Um, am I going to kind of step in and hurt them? How is it going to be? So it can be quite difficult to boldly name the injury. And I don't mean come in in some harsh way. I just mean actually naming it. Yeah. So, so when you turn to somebody else and you had that affair, da 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 da. Yeah. Because it can be really helpful to name what has not been able to be named in a calm and clear way. And we need to be able to name it to be able to put it into the cycle and to be able to work with it. Okay. And we need to, um, one of the things that is when it's so alive like this is the content is very drawing. Yeah. We can get caught into it so easily and into problem solving. Um, and what we need to do is we need to not get caught in the content tube. Yeah. So um, it's not that we're not talking any content. So um, I don't know if anybody's um, seen the new um, podcast on the, the leading edge by Ryan Rayana and, and Hawkins, but Alison Lee was talking on it. Um, and what she said was, it's not that you can't talk about content at all. What we want to do is not get stuck in content. In content is so much emotion. What you have to learn to do is use the content as opposed to restrict it out of the room. So we don't want to restrict it out of the room and we don't want to get really hooked by it either. Yeah, we want to be able to utilize it and get underneath it. Yeah, what we're interested in is the emotional effects that result from an attachment injury. So we're not trying to heal it. We're not trying to work out why it happened. We're getting into the cycle as we always do in stage one. Yeah, I'm not going to go through all the detail of this, um, but it's there for you. Yeah, we're de-escalating the cycle. We're tracking what happens. We're validating the essence of it. We're accessing underlying pain. We're framing the problem as the negative cycle that's keeping them from repairing the injury. And we are assuring them that we know they cannot trust yet. Yeah. That they cannot do the deep healing work at this point in time because it's not safe enough. But we know the path to help them walk down to be able to get to that point. Yeah. So that's really crucial. And this is the piece that can be really tricky. Yeah. Because you you want to get into the cycle and not all the content. So it's when you do this, yeah. When you see something that really triggers you into remembering the affair, yeah, you feel a real intense pain, you feel alone, you feel awful. Yeah. And then when that happens, you come out fighting. Yeah, and he doesn't see the pain, he sees the fighting, he feels as if he's being blamed, that there's no way he's going to get anything right, that it's just terribly awful and he withdraws. And when he withdraws, it proves to you that, see, he doesn't care. Yeah, and off you go. That's the kind of cycle that you help elucidate, yeah, and draw out and frame it as the cycle that's keeping them away from each other. And then when we move to stage two, this is where we can get hold of the attachment injury resolution model. Yeah, so it has eight steps, three phases or stages. Yeah, and we will do this either with the withdrawer, probably alongside the withdrawer re-engagement that kind of happened together or do withdraw a re-engagement so that you've got them really on board and do it then before pursue a softening. Okay. So we have de-escalation of the, this particular cycle. 
then we're promoting new positive cycles and then we have a reconciliation okay so what i'm using here is the article in 2013 by Zuccherini et al. It's forgiveness and reconciliation in EFT for couples. And this is the one where the research is really looking at the effectiveness of the attachment injury resolution model. And as far as I can see, it's the first time that, that the acronym AIRM is actually used rather than the whole thing. Yeah. So what we have, split it into the three phases um, we have the de-escalation <clears throat> and how does this take part yeah we have the injured partner talking about it often with lots of secondary emotion yeah in step two we have the offending partner kind of hearing it kind of but also being very protective of themselves so they're going to be withdrawing they're going to be defensive yeah, you then kind of take it round again. Um, the injured partner, you're unpacking that secondary emotion more. You're going underneath it more into the, the negative models of self and other. And you're going more into what it really meant to the person. Yeah. And then you go round again to the offending partner. And the offending partner is starting to be able to hear it a little bit more. You're unpacking again their secondary emotions and starting to have them get the attachment significance. Yeah, it, it's not that the, that the partner hates them. It's that they love them. And this was just so incredibly painful. Yeah. Then you're going around again. Yeah, so the injured partner, the now, is going into real primary feelings. Yeah, the vulnerability, the attachment um, related stuff that they're really exploring in depth. Yeah, so the example here is really lovely. It's like you had died, like you had gone away. Yeah, I felt so alone and abandoned. Yeah, so this, she's, the, this injured partner is now feeling safe enough to be able to share in a really vulnerable way. And then you're going back to the offending partner who is now so much more accessible. Yeah, so they're able to share remorse and regret, take responsibility, apologize from a place of having really heard and got the pain in, in the other person. So it's really different from the apologies that have been going along all the other time, which have been apologies, but have not heard the other. Yeah. And then the injured partner takes in that apology and takes in the accessibility of their partner again and actually makes a request. Okay. Expresses an attachment needs. You know, I need in some way to know this will never happen again and this is what i need yeah and then the offending partner responds to that in a way that the other takes in and what it does is it reconfigures a relationship where each is accessible and responsive and engaged and it's at this point but it's not in this particular model where they together create a new narrative about the the attachment injury itself and its meaning okay and if we have a, a look at an overview of the AIRM um, Lillian Buchanan wrote um, wrote this which goes to the tune of, of, of one of the operas I think um, but the, this might just help if, if all of that sounds a bit like gobbledygook yeah because I told you about my pain despite your minimizing and denial, then I could share about my attachment fears and longings. And then you told me that you understood and something of how it came about. So I was able to integrate and show my vulnerability. Then you engaged and owned your part and you expressed your deep remorse. And then I was able to ask for comfort and caring and you responded in such a caring way that I could say that we were one and once again had an attachment bond. 
Yeah, so I, I, that kind of hits me at a whole different level when I hear that. But one of the things I wanted to say, which might be confusing for you when you are reading the literature, is that I've used a model here that's got eight steps and it comes from a, a really key article by Zuccarini and Johnson and others, um, where they're looking at the effectiveness of the attachment injury resolution model. So they're using these eight steps. But what you will find when you're reading is that there's also a seven step model. Yeah, so the seven step, what it does is it puts together step one and step two. Yeah, um, so it's not that it's saying anything fundamentally different. It's just that that model was used just that model was first used in 2005 um, by Sue Johnson, the, seven, the, the model that has seven, where the one and two are joined together. Um, and then she does continue to use it and others do use it. So if you look, for example, at the excellent book, which is the third edition of the practice of emotionally focused couple therapists, you will find that that contains the seven. And you're also in the book that Sue's written on um, trauma, that that uses the seven. And some other people use the seven as well. But you'll you find this eight model used in this 2013 key article. You'll also see it used by Louis, Laurie Brubacher in her stepping into um, the EFCT and by some other people as well. And the reason that I've used the eight is that I like the rhythm of it. I like the rhythm of injured partner, offending partner, injured partner, offending partner. I think it's easier for us to think about in our heads and easier for us to follow. But don't worry if you, you, you know, you're looking at a book and it's got seven in it. Yeah, it's just the one and two there are joined together. Okay. So if you think about those eight what you have is some tasks. And Laurie Brubacher, again, is the only one who really looks at what are the specific tasks of the therapist through it. So she builds on the work that's been done on attachment injuries and attaches to it the tasks that we have. Um, you know, we're going to basically really support every step of that process and guide it through. Yeah, so in step one, we process the injured partner's account of the injury. Yeah, we validate the secondary emotions. So we are hearing some content here. We're validating their feelings. We're getting into some of those secondary emotions. And in step two, again, we're helping process the defensive responses of the partner. Yeah, help them hear a little bit of the attachment significance. And in step three, we support the injured partner to get into the attachment significance more. These are the areas that would not happen if you were not guiding it. Yeah, you're helping them get to the core of the pain. That's the piece that they may never have understood before. And in step four, again, you're unpacking those secondary emotions and seeing what's underneath that for the offending partner. Yeah, so step five, yeah, we're going deeper again. We're going really deep, supporting them to go into the primary emotions, the pain, the loss, the longings. Yeah, and in step six, we're processing the offending partner's primary emotional responses and getting them to really hear and get a felt sense of their partner's pain. And in step seven, we're processing the injured partner's accessibility and responsiveness. We're supporting them to make an, a reach and ask for something. And in step eight, we're processing the offending partner's responsiveness and supporting them to hear that and to respond to it. And here we have both partners task, create a new narrative of the event. Okay, so we're nearly at the end. And as we near the end of the attachment injury resolution, what's also important for us to note is that we can get hooked by really wanting relationships to repair, especially when they've done this kind of beautiful work. But 
people might forgive but not necessarily reconcile yeah so they might engage with the partner um, they might receive an apology but it doesn't mean that they will reconcile in the sense of wanting to restore trust and maintain the relationship so they'll be left in a lot better place with each other but not necessarily choosing to go on with the relationship and truly reconcile because the rep and the repair as we know from all that i've said it's way beyond cognitive forgiveness yeah it is taking the risk to put oneself in the other's hands and once again experience safety and trust both partners resilience is strengthened trust and dignity is restored for both partners as they co-create and consolidate the antidote to the shattered trust yeah it comes back to being about both people needing to create this okay and i've given you a slide there which has got the key resources on as i see it which is you know the um two particular articles and then um four of the key books the trauma book the workbook the case book um stepping into efct and the practice of efct okay so i hope all that came across well and looking across all of that what i didn't find was the answer to murian's actual question yeah which is creating a new narrative of the attachment injury but from all that i have said i think that you would be able to get a sense of how to do that so i'm hoping that in your chat in the chat bar um, some of you can give me some ideas as to what that means and how that occurs okay okay so judy's got a question and i'm not going to take the question at the moment judy because what i want to do is to have us help to um answer murian's question so yeah so sarah i think creating a new narrative happens when each is talking about the attachment significance of the injury yes that's i think that is absolutely great sarah yeah so yes the meaning shifts yeah we go from something where you did this to me to you know our relationship means so much to us that when this dreadful thing happened it shattered everything but now by being able to really share that again it has drawn us closer and it fits very much with for example when i've worked with couples where there's been affairs who have really worked through the whole process of attachment res injury resolution and have come to the conclusion that i'm sure several of you have had they say that um, I, it's not that I ever wished it had happened, but being able to now do this work on it means that we are in a stronger place than we have ever been before. Yeah. So Sandy, I'm thinking it becomes a powerful challenge that we face together. That is a beautiful way of saying it, yes. Yeah, Aniko, creating a new narrative is how do we code hope? I think of new rituals yes indeed yes that that might be part of what people do just like you know they're going on to do that in steps eight and nine of normal general eft yeah how do they have new rituals in there that are really going to support it yeah and philip doesn't a new narrative need to explain why the partner did what they did absolutely and that will have been part of the attachment injury exploring why that happened but there needs to it needs to happen in stage two where they're able to be really kind of vulnerable and open and both see that you know what that was about 
Helena, it is the then and there before the affair, for example, and the here and now conversation about where we are now. Yes, that actually initially, um, if commonly with an affair, it, it's very vibrant, it takes over, it becomes it. Yeah, by the time they've done the work, what becomes it is intimate relationship, closeness, being together. Yeah. Um, Jane, it's a reframing that occurs within healing. Some of you are just writing the most amazing phrases. That it's just like, let me take that as a quote. That's beautiful, Jane. And Marie Claire, the, the volatility of the attachment injury in the room is so challenging and it can trigger other issues. Absolutely. And you can have multiple attachment injuries. Um, and, and when you're working with those, you may need to work with more than one of them, but you wouldn't usually need to work with them all because the issues underlying it are fundamentally the same or very similar. Yeah. Core negative self-beliefs can be changed and healed. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fundamental work can really happen. Philomena, I think a new narrative means assimilating and accepting what has happened as part of their attachment history, but becomes an indication of strength and resilience and overcoming that makes the attachment stronger and more valuable even than it was before. That's lovely, Philomena. That builds on that example that I was giving as well. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. If only it went the way the repair suggests all the time. Absolutely, Fiona. Yeah. We have a challenge, don't we? It doesn't always, it, it's, it's hard work. It's intense work because of the, the distress that's there between the couple. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Claire's saying thank you. Sarah, it's about slowing it down and that's sometimes very hard. Yeah, slowing down something, especially when it's very, very lively and there's live pain in the room. Yes, yeah. Okay, that is absolutely fabulous. Okay, and I know that lots of you will probably have lots of questions about some of the specific ins and outs of that. And, you know, email me if you would like to, to ask that. Um, and, and, you know, maybe I could come back at the beginning of the next session and just answer some in a kind of really kind of tight and, and, a, and a, you know, quick way. Um, we shall see. OK. Um, so thank you for your help with that. I think you've, you've done that absolutely beautiful. And I hope that answers Murian's question as well as me having kind of done this massive overview that doesn't cover it, but kind of hopefully leads us towards it. Yeah. So let's just have a couple of those ones and then I'm going to move on. Okay, so Jane, a new combined story rather than two disparate ones. Beautiful. <coughs> and Sandy, a new narrative becomes we risked going right to the heart of what hurt so much and we found a way to genuinely heal. That is fab. Isabel, there was something in not really realising the depth of the hurt and then the gift of getting awareness. And then, oh, wow, we can talk about this hard and painful stuff. What a strength for our relationship. Murian says, yes, thank you so much. Okay, we've done it. Okay, we've done it. That's absolutely fabulous. Yeah, that is totally beautiful. And what I will do, I think I can do that, is, is I will write, um, I'll, I'll get hold of some of those and um, be, write them and, and send it out to us all. Yeah. So I would like to turn to two other questions that I got, and I hope that's okay with you. Yeah, I can save the chat. Thank you, Janine. I thought I could. Yes, I'll work out how to do that. Or it may automatically do it. Okay. So I'm just going to turn to a couple of other, uh, other questions, and we'll just deal with them um, a lot quicker um, and just look it at me rather than um, any um, PowerPoints this time. So one is, is around um, the assessment time um, of the work. And Deborah's questions were, how do I work with a couple 
who aren't able to clearly specify what they want from therapy or how they want their relationship to be different. And when dissatisfaction in the relationship is shared in individual sessions, should the therapist do a summary of these points so the couple aren't avoiding them, i.e. the therapist actually bringing them into the open. Okay, so really what I've done here is I've looked at what I would consider to be the three key books. Um, so I've looked at Sue Johnson's Attachment Theory and Practice. Um, I've looked at her um, the practice of emotionally focused couples therapy, the third edition, which is the 2021, and then Laurie's book on stepping into um, EFCT. So looking first at attachment theory and practice, the things that I found helpful around this theme are the first thing we've got to do is create safety in the therapeutic alliance. Yeah. And the individual sessions are confidential, but if issues come up that need to be addressed in the session with the two of them for a therapy to be effective, so we're talking about secrets here, um, then the therapist helps the individual to share those issues in ways that advance their relationship goals. Yeah, the practice is collaborative and respectful. So what that means is that it's clearly saying that the therapist wouldn't really be the one who was going to time to take a summary of dissatisfactions that were arising in the individual sessions and giving that to the two of them. That there is an important space where people can express themselves and it not be taken to the other. Where it does need taking, how does the therapist help to share those things? Yeah. What Sue also says is that in these initial sessions, there, there is an emphasis on clarifying and making cohesive sense of each client's experience, relationship processes and patterns. And I love that, yeah? Clarifying and making coherent sense. I mean, this is a lot of the work of EFT as we go deeper and deeper into people's experiences. But even in those early sessions, we have a role in clarifying and making coherent sense. Often the couple coming in, they're in such a level of distress and of kind of caught in particular locked ways of being with each other that all they can see is the negatives, um, that they don't know how it could be different because it feels inconceivable at this point. Um, and our job is to help. Yeah, so when couples come who aren't able to clear, clarify what they want from therapy or how they want the relationship to be different, it's our work to gently work on helping them clarify, on helping them make coherent sense of something that they cannot kind of get hold of. Yeah. Um, so if we then look at the third edition of the practice of emotionally focused couples therapy, absolutely excellent book, very recently published, what we see is that EFT is a synthesis of experiential and systemic approaches to therapy. Yeah, distress is maintained by the way that we organize and process our emotional experience. So the purpose of the individual sessions where people may express more dissatisfaction, some of that is about getting information, yeah, checking things that are difficult to explore in front of the spouse. Yeah, so if we're exploring things that are difficult to explore in front of the spouse, we're not then going to be wanting to be taking that back ourselves into the joint area. Yeah. Um, we want to be able to explore how each partner perceives the other and we can only do that fully at this point in the safety of the individual sessions. We want what she calls uncensored key perceptions of the other that may be useful in later therapy sessions. Yeah, and she's not meaning in later therapy sessions as in the therapist tells it, but that it gives us 
a sense of the feelings, the thoughts that are going on inside the person about the other. Yeah, so these are the, these are the things that are maybe not direct answers, but are things that are supporting us to be able to make sense and answer these questions. So when we look at Laurie's book, um, Stepping Into EFCT, what she gives us is the importance of the attachment lens that we as therapists work through. Yeah, but our role is to be able to see through the attachment lens all of the time and to help the, the, the clients normalize and make sense of this distressing drama that they're getting into. Um, the day attachment lens helps us depathologize. Yeah, so we're not seeing one as wicked and evil, for example, be, you know, because, you know, they see their partner in this way or, we're, you know, we're seeing the partner as horrible if they do those things. What we're doing is we're depathologizing. We're seeing it as an expression of distress. That's what we're hearing. Yeah, and that's the thing that we can take back from those individual sessions into the joint sessions. You know, what became apparent for me is that this relationship matters or this relationship is really kind of unsure can it make it but what it what you, both of you were really clear about was how distressed you are currently in this relationship yeah um so yeah so if we go back to Deborah's questions, how do I work with a couple who aren't able to clearly specify what they want from therapy and how they want their relationship to be better? I think what we can say there when we actually look across that kind of literature just to kind of give us some thoughts on it is it's quite common for people to not be sure. They've got so stuck in a negative interaction cycle that they cannot necessarily conceive of what would be better and they can and they if, especially if they don't really know much about therapy they may not have a clear idea about what they want from therapy and our job is to help kind of clarify and make coherent sense of something within that both getting that from them and giving it to them about what we know about the therapy process yeah and then the second question, when dissatisfaction in the relationship is shared in the individual sessions, should the therapist do a summary of these points so that the couple aren't avoiding them, i.e. the therapist bringing them out into the open? I think what we look at is we look at um, dissatisfaction being something that is really normal in a distressed mm -hmm. couple, that we're offering a space in the individual sessions for them to be able to express some things that they wouldn't be comfortable sharing in front of their partner at this stage. And, you know, for us to have a collaborative, respectful relationship as literally taking that into the next session would just work against us completely. But what we can do is we can take the underlying distress that's there and share that and use it as something that helps take us forward. Okay. Anybody have anything to add around those two um, questions that you, that you would like to add for Deborah? If so, just put it in the chat. Okay, I've covered it. Oh, I can think I can hear somebody typing. Just give you a minute to see if there's anything no okay right i'm just going to go across and i'm just going to have 10 minutes on uh, an, another question before i gather us all together and we can have some some last kind of chat about how it's been and everything okay so deborah says thank you that's great okay Judy asked a question earlier about stage one. Yes, I, I know that I know that. And, and what I said was that if people have specific questions like that, then if you could pass them on to me and then I can answer them. Um, and I can answer them one to one via email, or I can also gather them and you know give at the beginning of the next session a kind of clear response to those specific questions because I don't have time to do it right now. Okay. 
So that would be really helpful, Judy and anybody else who's got them. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, so but the, the next question, um, two people asked things that were related to it. So Camilla said, um, what about when somebody has a diagnosis or an illness and they use it against each other or make it an, an excuse not to change? Um, and then Anne asked, it's really tricky when you have somebody who's got a diagnosis and then in the therapy room, the focus tends to kind of be a lot on that person. So I would like to just explore that a little bit. So we have quite a number of articles around um, diagnoses and illness and EFT. We have it around um, heart disease, with depression, raising a child from the autis autism spectrum disorder. We have cancer, generalized anxiety disorder, um, and medical conditions, which is a bit broader. And then we have some chapters. Now, if you're interested, particularly in this area, then the book that you want, if you, you may already have it on your shelf, is the case book. Um, because the, the emotionally focused case book, um, which um, James Furrow, Sue Johnson and Brent Bradley edited, is fabulous. It, it, it's got three chapters in it from different people. Um, one is on depression, um, one is on aphasia and one is on breast cancer um, and related to EFT. So this is the source of fabulous stuff related to um, diagnoses and illness. Um, but I just wanted to kind of, again, gather some pieces from it that just help with those two questions. And again, it, you know, you, you don't find answers that are specific to it. You find things that kind of give you a sense of what that is. Um, so one of the crucial things that I was thinking about this morning is that although illness and attachment injuries can overlap, so an attachment injury can occur around a time of illness, um, for simplicity, let's take them separately. Um, but what is important is that with an affair, you have an offending partner. You know, it may not have been their fault even what happened, or it may clearly have been, um, but one partner is seen to have transgressed and is often blamed. There is an energy, an outer energy about it. Yeah, and the offending partner often experiences the defensiveness, the guilt and the shame. They, you know, they may have some feistiness about that and they may also be in a very withdrawn state. But when we're actually looking at when one person has an illness, the situation is quite different. Yeah. Um, so can we just use the chat bar again to, you know, can you imagine what the difference is yeah when we're not talking about an attachment injury we're talking about your partner having an illness you know what what might be some of the differences around how this couple might be Come on, you can risk writing something. <laughs> yeah? No fault on either part. It's about understanding the illness. You cannot lay blame. Yes. Yes. Thinking about the weight of shame. Yeah? Heightened fear of mortality. Fear. Shame in the one who's not affected when they do kind of, in their angst, blame the other person. Yeah, the, dom the illness can be dominating. Yeah. Falling into the role of a carer, feeling one's own emotional needs are not being met. So there's resentment. Yeah. The ill person feeling as if it's their fault. Yeah. Yes, Jenny, we're going to factor this into the relationship cycle. That's fabulous. Yeah. And of, yeah. Maybe more about what the partner hasn't done rather than what they have done. Guilt, yeah, yeah. Could be a trigger for previous trauma, absolutely, yeah. Always when, when intense things are happening, they can be a trigger for previous mm -hmm. things. Harder to talk through. 
fears around mor mor morality, mortality, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to give you a few bits from these three books just to give us a hint around how we could uh, kind of answer these questions, how the theory might help us just kind of get a, a better sense. Yeah, the illness is a way of not talking about the cycle, absolutely. Okay, so the three chapters in the, um, in the case book, uh, one's on breast cancer, one is on depression, and one is on aphasia. So they're quite different, they bring up some different elements, though obviously some fundamentals are, are, are quite the same. Um, so in the one on breast cancer, it, it gives us some of the, the literature around, you know, the, the couple relationship is so central in the coping and overall adjustment of both of the partners. Yeah. So what's often described is that when one person has a life threatening illness, um, the spouse the partner is seen as a primary source of support and, and may well be a really good source of support. Yeah, but over time, the illness experience and the treatment that's required, yeah, they, they can really provoke all sorts of emotional disturbance in both people. Yeah, it's such a stressor on the relationship um, where usually we would see it as neither person having, you know, a fault neither of them being able to be you know properly blamed if you like there can be a kind of relief in being able to blame somebody yeah but with illness what's what you're expected to do you're expected to, to be a caretaker so what they talk about in this chapter is three patterns that often happen yeah so you've got an open engagement pattern and this pattern is the one where they're able to talk about it, they're able to stay accessible and responsive and engaged. So this is the really positive one. Um, then you've got the second pattern, which is about mutual avoidance or protective buffering. Yeah, so this one is where they both kind of don't want to upset each other. So they hold on to their worries and concerns um, and they're kind of, separate in that aren't they what you can also get is unilateral avoidance which is where one does the avoiding and that's commonly seen when the woman is the one who's ill in a heterosexual relationship and the the, the man is the one who goes into a protector role where he also stops expressing feeling yeah, so he may feel as if he's doing everything for the other person, a protector and all the rest. I can't show my, my feelings. I can't have my needs. Um, but what the partner experiences is um, that the other one's gone away. Insensitive, rejecting. Yeah, that, that, where are they? And then the third interactional pattern is a pursue withdrawal pattern. Yeah, so it's, it's criticism. Um, and withdrawal and this is often where emotional support and engagement isn't there and the, the pursuing is the protest to it but as usual what happens is when the protest is there the other person withdraws even more yeah so we have three different ones there and you know we may well have um, in the pursue withdrawal one the one where Camilla's talking about when they use it against each other yeah but it can also happen in, in the other one where they're protectively buffering. I don't have to change if what I'm doing is just looking after you. Yeah. And we're not talking about it. Neither of us are talking about it to protect the relationship. There's no possibility for shift. Yeah. Um, so when we go across to um, the, the chapter on depression, um, what we what they are talking about is depression as something which can just devastates relationships um, and rela it, you know you can be depressed because of your relationship or you can be depressed and then that can cause really negative effects on the relationship um, and what that article gives us more of a flavor of is the more negative communication that can happen in depression because of the depression so there can be a lot of blame and withdrawal um, a lot of verbal aggression, um, irritability, loss of motivation, 
loss of the ability to experience pleasure. And in this one, you may get more of that sense of what Camilla's talking about of when they use it against each other, just in that real struggle um, of that real change in the person. And what we have to do, which is what some of you have already been saying, is we have to frame those depressive symptoms as part of the negative cycle. Yeah, we have to help externalize the depression as the common enemy of both partners. Yeah, and this is one of the things that, that we can connect with Anne's question when the focus seems to be on the one with the diagnosis, is how do we kind of shift it so that we get both of them engaged and the way that we do it is that we start to pick up on the cycle because you know the point of the cycle is that it's got two pieces yeah it's got both people in it so as soon as you start working with the cycle you start to shift it not so that it is necessarily equally balanced all the time it may be that that one person needs more attention for quite a while you know as we experience in all of our couples sometimes um, but as we externalize the cycle as the common enemy, it incorporates both people. Yeah. But one of the things that they bring up, which is really important, is around safety. That the therapist has to make a clinical judgment that the depressed person is able to tolerate the negative emotions that are explored in stage one of EFT. Yeah. So the person has to be resilient enough to hear the underlying feelings. Yeah, the, the secondary reactive emotions and the underlying feelings, yeah? Can they actually cope with that? I mean, often they will be able to because they're already hearing a lot of stuff that's maybe being expressed. But if you're actually talking about something like the protective buffering where none of it's being spoken, that might be where you're really looking at, can they take it? But if you're in a real pursue withdraw where it's all out there in the open and it's massive anyway, it's like, actually, they're more likely to be resilient because they're not going to hear anything any different. OK, and then in terms of aphasia, the chapter on that, I mean, that's about the loss of ability to use language. And, you know, Shadden in 2005 terms. Um, the impact of this on both the person with aphasia and their partner as identity theft, and that the partner moves into an imposed withdrawn position. Yeah, with the partner being aphasic, it means that you're not able to fully express yourself to them in a way that they can understand. And you will often get a withdraw, withdraw cycle. And it's a lovely chapter where they're talking about EFT therapists working with um, speech and language therapists to support the couple therapy process. Um, so we come back to the simplicity of putting everything into the cycle, of calming the distress, um, but it's really helpful to know the chapters to look at so that we can look at them in more specific detail around illness. Yeah, so I hope that's been helpful as well. Um, Sarah said, if anyone wants a copy of the research on using EFT with the parents of children on the autistic spectrum, they can email her because she's been very involved with that. Yeah. Um, Thelma, if the injurer is a fighting a drink problem. Yeah, I particularly didn't go into things like the ad addiction process. It's not an area that I know a whole lot about and I wanted to keep illness separate from addiction at this point so that if you want to ask a question around that then email me about that okay collaboration with carers I love this that's all right what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute you all and um, if there's anything that you'd like to say on the chat or verbally about your experience of today then that would be really lovely Okay, and if we cannot have everybody go to video, it doesn't matter if the odd person does, but if everybody does, it's just going to send some people's Wi-Fi overloading. Okay. Right. Thank you from Soraya. It's been very rich and lovely. Um, Jenny, thank you. Sarah, lovely. Okay, does anybody want to say anything out loud? Thank you. It's been really helpful, and um, particularly with my 
specific clients. Thank you. Mm. Okay, it's a pleasure. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Sandra, for the literature that you sent us and mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the meeting. I'm really sorry I came in late. That's okay, Hazel. Thank you for being able to join us. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Right. Um, thank you so much for the for everything you said today. It's a, it make a lot of sense in so many ways. I would love to receive um, some article about the um, addiction. If you don't mind sending me that, would you like me to send you separately? Yeah. If you email me, then I will look up and see what I can do. Thank send you. you in the right direction for it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sandra. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. I'm really heartened. I, it's lovely to be online with everyone and have your mm. fabulous, heartful input to us all. Really generous. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. That's lovely. And I'm seeing such a lot in the chat bar and I'm seeing some pointers of sometimes when I've changed from one theme to another that that's been a bit kind of quick. Yes, I, I completely accept that. It, it's just that thing of wanting to make sure everything's in there. So, yeah, I get it. Thank you for all of, of, of what you're saying in that chat bar. I will definitely be reading about it. Yes. Okay. So, useful, inspiring, encouraging. Okay, your way of slowing everything down makes sense. Yes, slowing down is always, always the answer, even in webinars. So yes, um, hopefully I slowed things down as well as uh, speeding things up a bit too, too much sometimes. Yes, thank you to the team for offering these ways of us remaining connected. Thank you, Isabel. That's very much what um, our wish has been to help people be connected and, and keep growing and developing. Yes. Yeah. Looking forward to the next one. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Next session, um, Camilla has asked about pursuer and withdrawer. And um, that's inspired me because I would really like to do a similar thing and look over the literature to do with pursuer and withdrawer and obviously it will include um, pursuer softening and withdrawer re-engagement. So if anybody have got any questions that are specific related to pursuers and withdrawers, please email me and that will help me focus. Um, and if you have any other questions to be the smaller questions within the session, then um, please email me. Um, and in the meantime, I, I wish you well and, and stay safe, I hope. Sorry, I just wanted to say that I'm brand new to EFB and mm -hmm. I was really anxious if I would understand anything. And I, yes. it was really easily understandable the way you described. So I'm so <sighs> grateful. Thank you so much. It took a lot away. Thank you, Gabriella. That means a lot to me. Yes, that, that, I'm really, really glad you were able to, uh, to, to pick up from it. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, bye for now, everybody. And thank you so much for coming. Yeah, we've, we've had about 65 people uh, at one point, which was just totally amazing. Can we have a cup of tea in a minute? <laughs>